I'm Diana Wentworth, and I'm so excited to be with you. I'm the co-founder of the Inside Edge Foundation for Education. It's been a forum for thought leaders and all kinds of people who are activists in the world where they meet and greet and expand who they are. And we've been recording 1,500 of our past speakers. And we're going to take the very best of these and offer them on our YouTube channel. We're starting to post them weekly. So what you wanna do is go to our YouTube channel and to subscribe to it, and you'll get all kinds of information about what we're offering. It's so thrilling to be offering this legacy to you now. It feels really good. Okay, so now let's see, we're going to uh, move along to back to Robin and she's going to introduce our speaker. We're ready to go. Yes, I get the honor today to introduce Lisa. You know, I have this real passion for labyrinths and and I'm so, so excited that we found her. Lisa actually came to us through our member, um, Pete, um, Peter Havlin. And uh, Lisa is, has really made her life's work around labyrinths. She's an artist. She's a professional labyrinth maker. She's an advanced labyrinth facilitator and a certified mentor, or a certified mediator, sorry. She said she's, she's made hundreds of labyrinths. Uh, she's done from room size, canvas, portable labyrinths to permanent concrete installations. Um, her work is, can be found internationally in schools and hospitals, churches and more. <clears throat> she's also the owner of uh, her business called Paths of Peace. And that's in uh, Stillwater, Minnesota, where she's coming to us from today. And she takes care of 15 outdoor labyrinths and a fleet of canvas rentals, it says. So anyway, she'll tell us a little more about herself as we go on later, but uh, please help me in giving a very warm welcome to Lisa. Thank you, thank you. So it's a delight for me to be with you and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for Peter for, for introducing me to Inner Edge. Um, and um, I just like to do some of my work in presenting the labyrinth to you through some PowerPoint slides. So I'm going to share my screen. So labyrinths, ancient paths for modern times. So for some of you who are brand new to labyrinths, and I'm delighted to know that so many of you have experience in walking labyrinths, but some people will confuse the terms labyrinth and maze. Uh, and if you go to the dictionary, it's, the two terms are used interchangeably. So it's understandable how people might confuse them. So the image at the top is a maze and you'll see that it has dead ends and places where you have to make choices of which way to go. Um, so the mazes are actually games to confuse and puzzle you. They have tricks and dead ends and choices to be made. You have to use logic to solve the puzzle. And you may become lost and you may never find the goal. Now labyrinths are quite different from that. They have a single path into the center. But as looking at the labyrinth, it's sometimes difficult to, dis to distinguish how it is that you're going to actually get there. But it's quite it's quite simple if you simply put one foot in front of the other and follow the path, you are guaranteed to get to the center. It will take you there without any decisions or without any tricks. So the labyrinth has a way of calming us and soothing our spirit. It encourages uh, introspection and contemplation and focus. And you're guaranteed success. You will get to the center as long as you just pay attention to the path and there is no wrong way. And it helps us to remember that the journey is as important as the goal. Now most labyrinths are two dimensional. So you can actually see the goal, but it's not readily apparent how you're going to get there. So the challenge is to let go of that need to figure it out or to be in control 
and just trust that path. And when we do that, we are allowed to move out of our head and into our heart, our body, our spirit, and it allows us to move into a meditative way of being. It also allows us to move through this meandering back and forth rhythm of the labyrinth that can add to that sense of calming and centering and soothing. Now, some of you might think that labyrinths are new because you might not have heard of them before, um, but they are actually quite old and they have a mysterious origin. We don't know who made the first one, where, or why. We know that they are over 4,000 years old. The earliest ones are difficult to date because they are simply symbols carved onto stone. But the same design appears around the world in places, societies, communities that didn't necessarily interact. So that's part of the mystery of the labyrinth. And the design crosses cultures and spiritual traditions. And so we consider the labyrinth image as an archetypal image, as it is seeming to have appeared a, 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 all by itself for people around the world. So this screen, uh, this slide will show some images of some of the earliest known labyrinths. And you'll see they're just simply carved into stones and found all around. Uh, the oldest uh, known ones currently, are on rock boulders in the northwest of Spain in the Galicia area. That's the photo up on the upper left. Now there are many of these on boulders um, spread out in the fields. The boulders are out um, unprotected and you can walk through and, and find these um, on your own if you know where they are. Now to give you a sense of how difficult it is to to date these labyrinths, if you look at the image on the lower right, Rocky Valley, England, some archeologists believe that is as old as the Bronze Age, where others believe it's as recent as the 18th century. Now that's quite a big gap there. Um, and most, as I said, most of these are simply carved into stones and are quite small. They're usually associated with ceremonies or stories, um, uh, never see, they don't seem to be associated necessarily with evil. The one on the upper right, you'll see some sort of strange looking images there, but it seems to be related to a hunt and some success in, in some hunting. And the labyrinth in the center on the bottom from India, that looks like it could be big enough for walking, but there are other images on that big rock face of birds and animals, and it does not appear that the intention there was for walking. Again, just another symbol um, for whatever meaning might be. Now in this slide, I'm trying to offer the variety of ways that labyrinth image has shown up. Uh, the indigenous Sami folk in Arctic Russia use labyrinths in rituals for protection. Um, in, in, there are several of the indigenous tribes in the Southwest United States adapted the labyrinth uh, to describe their sacred story of creation. And many of those images were woven into baskets. The floor mosaics from first century Roman settlements, um, very ornate designs, again, not intended for walking, but for a decorative purpose, used as a diagram of a city or maps. One of the Nazca lines in Peru is labyrinthian. And then another image of a coin where the labyrinths were, were minted onto the coin. So most of the labyrinths that I've shown you thus far are from variations of this particular design, which is called a seven circuit classical labyrinth. Classical because it's the oldest labyrinth known. Seven circuit because if you follow the path, which is the white space between the black lines, you'll see that you circle around seven times before you actually reach the goal. So we call it a seven circuit classical labyrinth. Now this labyrinth is actually quite easy to make. 
if you know the trick on how to build it. So we start out with a series of lines and dots, which we call a seed pattern. It's like planting the seeds of the labyrinth. But through a systematic process of connecting those lines and dots, we'll see how that labyrinth can, be, can appear for us. So let's see how this works. And almost like magic, we have a seven circuit classical labyrinth. So you can see that this didn't require um, an instruction manual in order to make it. If you just know the trick of how to connect the dots and lines, it's possible to explain how this labyrinth design may have moved around the world. Now, as we move further um, into the story of labyrinths, in the early part of the Christian era, this labyrinth appeared um, as possibly the first Christian labyrinth in a, in a Christian setting. And you can see that it's almost like four labyrinths put together. There's a little squiggly line that begins the entrance into this labyrinth. And if you were to follow the path of this labyrinth, you'll see that the path spirals in and out of the lower right quadrant, and then it moves up to the upper right quadrant, the upper left quadrant, and then the lower left quadrant before the path brings you into the center. And in the center, there's a word puzzle that spells out Santa Ecclesia in several directions. Santa Ecclesia meaning Holy Church. Now again, this labyrinth is not big enough to walk. It's just a design that was found in this basilica in Algeria. But it's interesting that it includes um, these quadrants and also a word puzzle of the whole, putting the Holy Church at the very center of this labyrinth. Now, as the labyrinth moved through age, through the different centuries, the designs continued to morph and new designs appeared, new adaptations um, were made. And interestingly, over time, the interest in labyrinth seemed to ebb and flow a bit. There were periods of time when there was a decreased interest in labyrinths, um, and there's almost as though the labyrinth would go dormant. And then there would be periods of time where there'd be a heightened use of labyrinths. And these periods of heightened use seem to be associated with times when a society or a community was going through a great deal of turmoil, war, or plagues, that sort of thing, maybe pandemics. So it seems as though the lab labyrinth appears for us when we need it most, to soothe, to calm, to offer a place of solace from a frenzied world. And that certainly applies to our society today. So for me, there is little wonder why there's such a great increased interest in labyrinths today. So, Back to our labyrinth journey through time, in the Middle Ages, labyrinths began appearing, large labyrinths, in um, the Gothic cathedrals throughout Northern Europe. Now, most of these were walkable size, but there's very little documentation that tells us how they were used. The most famous of these is the one at the cathedral in Chartres, France. Now you may recognize this design because it has been replicated thousands of times in recent days or recent years. And it is that same design that some of you have mentioned finding at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco and other locations um, in your own neighborhoods. About the same time that labyrinth was being built or, or the labyrinths that were being installed in the Gothic cathedrals, there were labyrinths being built other places as well. Sweden at that time had more, lab, or more labyrinths than any other country in the world. Over 400 have been documented, most of them being um, stone labyrinths that were built on, in seasonal fishing villages out on the coast of 
of the Baltic Sea. These were used for good luck for the fishermen, um, for, for ceremonies of courtship and springtime dances and uh, fertility, lots of different uses for these stone labyrinths. And then in the southwest of England, another example of labyrinths being built, cut right into the turf. And these labyrinths tended to be in the center of community places where festivals and gatherings took place. So as we move into how we are using labyrinths today, there are some ideas of different ways that we can walk, but a typical walk that some of you may be familiar with involves the three phases. Walking into the center, spending some time in the center, and then following the path to walk it back out again. So that walking in, standing at the entrance and, and stepping into the labyrinth and walking toward the center is a time to release distractions, to become open and receptive and aware of your present time. Once you reach the center, that's a period for receiving, spending some quiet moments in the center of the labyrinth and receiving whatever wisdom is forthcoming for you there. And then when you're ready to leave the center, you follow that path back out, retracing it from the center back out to the entrance again as a way of integrating the wisdom or the knowledge that was gained in that labyrinth experience. So while there are very few rules of walking a labyrinth, and this process of three phases is not a requirement in and of itself, but you're walking with an open heart, a quiet mind, being receptive, following your own pace, and moving in whatever way feels natural. Those are the, those are the easiest ways that to, to walk the labyrinth. The challenge with walking a labyrinth is letting go of those distractions and focusing on the rhythm of your breath, following, feeling the sole of your feet against the ground or your finger in the groove of a tabletop version, to be present, to maintain silence, to listen, to observe, to follow your own pace and move as it feels natural. Each experience is going to be different depending on what you bring to the labyrinth that day. Perhaps ask a question or walk in prayer, sing, dance, twirl if it feels right, but honor that path and those with whom you share it if you're walking with others. And when you reach the center, linger there, but when you feel ready to step out, retrace the path or walk directly off if that is what feels right for you. Just trust that whatever way you do is the right way for you at that time. So in our current state of COVID pandemic, many labyrinth events are canceled. Finding a labyrinth to walk and maintain social distancing may be difficult. Many are turning to finger labyrinths and online virtual finger labyrinth Zoom events. Tracing a labyrinth with your finger is a bit different than walking a labyrinth. So I'm not sure if many of you have had that experience, but let's try this. Using this image, the path of this labyrinth is a golden path. You may follow it with your eyes or your computer cursor, or even with the fingertip of your non-dominant hand. Follow that path slowly into the center. Spend a few moments in the center and then slowly trace the path back out again. You may wish to carry the question or the concern that you formulated in our opening meditation and allow that to inform your walk in this virtual labyrinth. Or you may just choose to simply pay attention to your breath and experience whatever is here for you. So I'm going to invite you to find a comfortable position to take a few deep breaths. I will start with music and when the music ends, we will move into breakout rooms to share the experience. So a few deep breaths and let's begin.
Okay. Robin, are you going to introduce our breakout rooms? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. So um, this will be kind of a quick breakout room. We just want to give you a minute to touch in with each other and share what your experience was with um, that labyrinth. If you had any, you know, your journey in, your time in the center, your time out, just, just a minute each. We're going to make it really short. Um, Rebecca, can we do that? Can we make that adjustment to a minute each? And then we're going to have a second breakout room that's longer, but we just want to do a quick touch in on this one. Okay. Well, that was fun, huh? <laughs> okay, so Lisa is going to um, go right back into some of her presentation. We have another uh, bit of her slideshow where um, we'll go a little deeper, and then we'll have a second breakout session right after that. Now I'm going to take you back through some of the uh, spaces where labyrinths are being found and being used today. So in the last 25 years or so, we've experienced the resurgence of interest in labyrinths, especially as a spiritual tool. And these following slides I have are some examples of my work and the different kinds of places that labyrinths are being quickly into the church settings. Whoops, am I muted? No. no. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. I just had a little sign that said I was muted. Um, so moving into churches and retreat centers as places for walking prayer and places of solitude. Then the understanding of the benefits of labyrinths as a co complementary healing modality were discovered, resulting in the use of labyrinths in cancer care centers, hospitals, and healing centers. And then soon schools and universities began using the labyrinths in problem solving, conflict resolution, recreation, and other curricula. As you see, there's lots of different styles and, and ways to, that labyrinths are being built. Uh, labyrinths in city parks became multi-purpose gathering places for community activities, including platforms for yoga and tai chi and a playground for the spirit. So the labyrinth on the top is uh, one of my designs that allows two people to walk the labyrinth together side by side on adjacent paths. So it, it encourages some conversation. So walking a labyrinth isn't always a quiet, silent activity. Now in senior living complexes, rehabilitation centers and memory care units, Labyrinths support residents in their life transitions. Labyrinths can be a crucible for creativity in art centers and studios. And now, especially now, there's an expanded use of labyrinths in residential homes and private gardens as people are staying home more and not able to find um, labyrinths nearby. Labyrinths are used both as joyful wedding celebrations and at funeral homes and cemeteries to hold tears of grief. They're used to encourage deep conversation in spiritual direction and therapeutic settings. So as a spiritual director myself, I often will begin a session by walking in with my client into the center of the labyrinth. And we may sit at the center to speak and then walk back out again to close the session. I'll do the same using a finger labyrinth where we open the client will use the labyrinth um, following the path into the center to begin our session. And then at the end, begin at the center and follow that path back out to integrate whatever we were discussing in our conversation. Using the labyrinths in seasonal festivals and activities can be great fun. I love that picture of the dancing girls on that rainbow labyrinth. And using it in community activities such as this is a food drive where people collected food for the local food shelf and created a labyrinth for us to uh, experience the bounty that would be sent. So over the 20 years that I've been working with labyrinths, 
Um, I have been playing with them on my own property in Stillwater. I have five acres and my, my uh, college work is in art uh, with a concentration in design. And when I started learning about the labyrinth as a spiritual tool, I discovered it could be a great way for me to combine my spirituality and my art. So over the years, different labyrinths have appeared and I've had up, up to 15 at a time on my property, made out of lots of different materials and all. But soon I was asked, being asked to install labyrinths at area churches and other locations and hospitals and to make room-sized portable labyrinths um, for use indoors. Well, here in Minnesota, we, the outdoor use of outdoor labyrinths is pretty seasonal. So using uh, canvas labyrinths or even permanent indoor labyrinths um, is, is a, nece a necessity during certain seasons, of course. And now my labyrinth work can be found around the world. This is one we built in Kenya. So um, along with historical patterns, I've been commissioned to do some uh, unique designs for certain, for certain changing needs um, in our current society. So this one is a pink ribbon labyrinth for a breast cancer survivor support program. The dual path labyrinth, which was originally designed uh, at the request of a elementary school uh, social worker who wanted to integrate the five steps of peaceful conflict resolution so that two children could walk the path together and move through those steps of conflict resolution. Now this design has morphed over the, over the years and now becomes um, uh, used as an anti-bullying labyrinth, uh, kindness, teaching kindness, community awareness and connectedness without the, without the words painting into the paths. I was asked to create a butterfly labyrinth for a local school that is a school for the children on the autism spectrum. So this labyrinth um, is a, it looks like a simple design. Sometimes the children will walk with their therapist behind them on the path. And sometimes I'm told, the students will crawl into the labyrinth like a caterpillar. And when they get into the center, which is sort of cocoon shaped, they'll, they'll, they'll crouch down into the center for a while. And then when they feel ready, they burst open and fly out like a butterfly along those paths. I'm told that the labyrinths for this school are being used great, with great success in helping the children to focus and to help to encourage some conversation then after they've walked the labyrinth. And then more recently, Peter Lavin, one of the Inside Edge members who is here, had asked me to create a labyrinth to support his Camino project with the goal of building a labyrinth along the Camino in Spain. Now with the many challenges that we're facing today in our society with the COVID, I'm finding calls for labyrinths to be even more necessary. And so this tree of life design is um, installed at a local COVID uh, center here in St. Paul, Minnesota, but similar labyrinths are being installed around the country. Dozens of portable labyrinths are being ordered by hospitals in COVID hotspots to provide solace and support for caregivers and first responders. And to VA centers to support our veterans. Here, a suicide awareness and prevention program at Fort Hood. So those just give us few ideas of how the labyrinth is being used in today's, in today's world with today's challenges. But the applications for use of the labyrinth are limited only to your imagination. The okay. labyrinth can be a great way to encourage conversation. You know, so if you're looking for ideas for, for you know, something new or new presentations, carry that question into the labyrinth as you walk and, 
and allow your experience to inform you, you'd be surprised how much you can get generate new ideas because the labyrinth works with our own inner wisdom. It just allows us to move into that space and to let those things come forth for us. And you mentioned the, the words that are on the labyrinth. As I've morphed or used that, that particular design over the years, that was the earliest fuss, first one made in 2003, I think it was. And I've started taking the words out of that labyrinth. Sometimes I'm color coding so that they can, you know, put their own questions at those spots. Mm -hmm. um, teachers are using it to ask questions so two students can work through, you know, certain questions or ideas within their subject matter. And um, getting to know your your neighbor, the the other, so to speak, in our in our society. So often we're afraid of each other when we don't know enough about them. So asking a series of very simple questions that we all about things that we all experience, like what's your favorite food? What's you know what holiday do you celebrate? Um, those sorts of questions so we can learn about each other. So a part of community awareness. So yes, that particular design and using a dual path, allowing people to, you know, create their own questions to be used in that is really working lovely. Um, well, I, go ahead. I'm noticing on the screen that the little boy is walking on one that's a portable canvas one. Is that something that you offer on your website? Yes, yes, yes. I have a, a website called canvaslabyrinths.com. And so, yes, I, I make labyrinths, but I also rent labyrinths. So I have oh. two dozen, two dozen rental labyrinths that, uh, you know, if you want to rent it for an event or a, a period, you can do that as well without investing in the purchase of one. How did you get into labyrinths in the first place? What was your first experience uh, that led you on this wonderful path? Well, I've had a lifelong interest in labyrinths and mazes, but as a child, it was for games and playing and that sort of thing. So in the uh, late 1990s, I attended a, a large international conference and one of the breakout sessions was using a labyrinth as a spiritual tool. So it was when I went into that session and I realized, wow, this is this beautiful design painted on canvas. And so my, my artwork in, or my college work in art and design, the, the design was intriguing to me. But then as I watched people walking it, I got a sense that there is something much more deeper there than just paint on canvas. Um, and so that's when I started really researching labyrinths and uh, built my first labyrinth in my yard two weeks later. And that's the beginning of the journey and it, it hasn't stopped. <laughs> now I'm full time. I work, it's a full time profession and I'm, I'm behind on my orders just because I need to be doing other things all the time. So it's uh it's really a wonderful journey to be on and i i appreciate being able to do this work because it feels like it's my hard work in the world i love the place where you gave us just the beginning with the little dots and the lines and then and we you showed us how to create it yeah yep. is that something that you discovered in your research or did you figure that oh, sure. out sure you, you can find that a lots of places online so oh. it's not it's not a secret <laughs> it's one of the very basic things with the labyrinths, yep, yep. So when you design your own, for instance, like the butterfly design and everything, how do you start with doing something like that? Hmm. Well, it, you know, part of it, it begins with a conversation, you know, with the client to find out what their use of labyrinths are, how they have, want to use it. The butterfly design in particular, um, well, actually there are two butterfly designs, but both of those people wanted butterflies. And so the one that is at the school for autistic children, um, their school motto uh, or their school mascot is a blue butterfly. Um, the Carner blue, uh, which is a butterfly that's facing extinction in our area. And so that was their school's name and mascot. And so it just kind of moved easily into doing a simplified version of a butterfly for that particular setting. Diana, Judy Linehan has a question, has her little blue hand up. Oh, good, Judy, Judy, talk to us. 
It's more of a, um, a statement. I was wondering, Lisa, if you could share with folks how they can find a labyrinth near them. I understand there's a website. And yeah. I, I can't and I remember. Have, the next slide I have to show has that <laughs> on it. <laughs> and Rebecca is also going to send out a PDF of that slide. So you won't need to you know, write things down. But uh, everyone will get a copy of some links for information and that sort of thing. So thank you so much. I use it every time I travel. Great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Yes, indeed. Is there a particular book that you think is the best resources? Oh, uh, there are so many books on labyrinths right now. Are there? Do you have a favorite? The, <laughs> one of the earliest ones um, on using the labyrinth as a spiritual tool was written by Lauren Artress and it's called Walking a Sacred Path. And um, that one is a beautiful, beautiful book about, um, you know, you incorporating the labyrinth in a spiritual process. So she was a canon at the Grace Cathedral. And so her early work was really within that within the church. There are a lot of labyrinths, um, or labyrinth books that have been written over the last two decades. And um, it's, if you just go to Amazon and do Labyrinth and avoid the David Bowie movie references, <laughs> okay, you'll find, you'll find a lot of books there. <laughs> Good. Well, that was the person that Judy trained with, I think. So that's that sounds like that's a very very good resource. Yeah, both of us uh, the training. Lisa, would you like to share with us? Uh, you know, what's up next for you? What's exciting? What what you offer? Uh, so that we all have a really good idea about that. So this is the resources. Rebecca will send this out to people. But Judy mentioned this website, the first one, Finding a Labyrinth. So if you're looking for a labyrinth near where you are or where you're traveling, um, there's a great website, a database uh, website of labyrinths. There's over 6,000 labyrinths listed there around the world. It's labyrinthlocator.com. And you can just type in your zip code and search a radius of 5, 10, 15 miles and find all of the labyrinths that are near you. So that's a lovely resource for finding a labyrinth. Um, the Labyrinth Society has a great website that has an entire section on research and publications. If you're interested in, in um, studies and research that have been done using the labyrinth, that one, and it also has other information, downloadable things for children, and a lot of good information at labyrinthsociety.org. My two websites, Paths of Peace and canvaslabyrinths.com. Um, if you were looking for a product, a canvas labyrinth or, or a finger labyrinth, um, those, or a rental labyrinth, you can reach me at those. And then Viritas, which is Lauren Artress's program um, that's based just uh, outside of San Francisco. They're offering during this pandemic period weekly virtual labyrinth walks. And so it's on, a fr on Friday afternoons generally, but you can go to the Veritas website there, veritas.org, and get information on their work and also the calendar that shows when the virtual labyrinth walks will be. So that's a good, that's a, a good place to look. And you asked for um, what's new for me, what's coming up. Mm -hmm. My, uh, I, I offer pilgrimages to other international locations, typically to from Paris. We walk from Paris to Chartres um, in France, and um, I also lead pilgrimages in, in Ireland. Um, obviously, those have been put on hold for me because of the pandemic, and uh, that's a bit sad, but I'm looking forward to a time when we can resume those again. And then I'm getting lots and lots of orders for, for products, especially now because of the, uh, the pandemic when people aren't out or it's difficult to social distance on labyrinths. So if you're asking um, about finger labyrinths, there's a lot of different labyrinths there. I'm going to stop this um, share and I just want to take a moment and show you one of the, one of the labyrinths that I have 
that um, I ha has a personal story to it. So one of the labyrinth designs I have is the, these wooden labyrinths that are uh, classical labyrinth, that one that we learned to draw that showed that image on it. About five years ago, my husband had a stroke and he lost all use of the left side of his body. And so he went to some intensive, you know, hospital uh, rehabilitation. And part of this process was that I had brought this labyrinth in for him. And when he began um, trying to use the labyrinth, he could only use his right hand to steer the finger on his left hand through the grooves of the labyrinth because he could not use his left hand. But it became a daily practice for him to, to move into a place where he could actually use both hands, use his left hand on it. And then one of the fun things about this is that this labyrinth comes as a set of two. So you can hook them together. Whoops, I have that upside down. Mm -hmm. So you can hook them together. So once he got to a point where he could move his left hand independently, connecting the two side by side, one hand in each labyrinth and trying to move his left hand at the same rate that he could use his right hand. Mm -hmm. And so that moved him further through that, um, the healing process and he's almost fully recovered now. Oh, good. Oh, so that's exciting. Those are exciting ways that the, you know, the labyrinth is moving into recovery and, and healthcare. Well, we want to thank you so much for such an enlightening presentation. I mean, it really is stimulating to all of us. We've had some wonderful feedback in the chat. Thank you, everybody, for showing up and being your beautiful selves. So you can take yourself off mute. We can say goodbye to each other. And you're free to leave and sign off. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So much. Right. Thanks again, goodbye, Lisa. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good morning. Learning.